Good morning, ladies. Good morning. We are on week two. It was, it's our third time together, but it's week two in your books that we're going to discuss. So, welcome, Jan. And I, I struggled with this one this week. Um, I started working on it the other night till way late after it was all quiet in the house. And it, was, it just wasn't, it wasn't sitting right. So yesterday I went back and changed it. And the Lord helped me do it a little differently. So anyway, we're going to put that together. But let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for these ladies that are here, that are eager to, eager to study your word and learn what you have to say to us. Lord, that we can be preparing our hearts and getting ready to hear from you. And I just thank you that you want to, um, you want us to hear from you, but sometimes either we're not listening or you're not speaking because of some issue. And Lord, I thank you that you point out those issues to us. And I just thank you that you enable us to change our lives, to make up to what you would have for each one of us. And I thank you for that now in Jesus name. Okay, week two, on day one, it starts on 28, okay, that last sentence on that introductory paragraph says, we need to know what he really desires so that we can be in intimate relationship with him. I love that, um, that intimate relationship. That's, that's what it's all about. That's why he created us, right? That intimate relationship. I remember years ago um, teaching Sunday school, and I was really busy, so I thought, I'll buy a curriculum that's all put together. I was teaching teens or junior high, or somewhere along there. And they were saying the book of Genesis, and I thought, oh, good, a good place to start. It was a waste of my time. I had to rewrite every single lesson, because the reason that they gave for, for God creating man was so that he would have someone to tend his garden. Hmm. Oh. Mm. Wow. And, and, and the reason that Cain was not except, oh, he had a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. Said nothing about, he didn't bring what God required, a blood sacrifice, he didn't bring that. He brought what he wanted. It, it, he didn't, it didn't say anything about it. Mm -hmm. But the reason God created man was not to tend the garden. It was for the intimacy. He wanted fellowship. He wanted fellowship. So anyway, I like that. So. In day one, you were concentrating on God's glory. So, um, what when we talk about God's glory, what comes to your mind? His creation. His creation. What else? The illumination of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit living within us. Uh huh. The Holy Spirit. Mm hmm. The definition here was um, of, of, of glory is uh, means abundance, riches, honor, dignity, splendor, and reputation. So to give God glory means to ascribe to him due honor. Is he due honor? Absolutely. Absolutely he's due honor. And... Um, so when we take our focus off ourselves, training our eyes on him, God chooses to speak to those who are focused on his glory. Right. And I thought that was so, so good. I love that, that quote there. So how can we give God glory? How can we give him, ascribe to him the honor that's due him? Well, prayer, prayer. Talking with him. Uh huh. Talking with him. There's lots of ways. So, yes. Just if you think of something, just name it out. 
Worship and praise. Worship and praise. I like to play um, a Christian music all day from a Christian radio channel. And throughout my day, I've got different things going on, generally when I'm home. And I do it in the car also. But it seems like the music comes in and, I, you know, it's, it keeps me in prayer mm -hmm. and, and, and reverence for the Lord all day long. And that has been really beneficial for me. Mm -hmm. It's been going on now since I came here. Yeah. Before I do my homework. I think we no. Go ahead, Mary Clark. Before I do my homework, I figured out this week it was so personal. Mm -hmm. Of course I cried it seemed like every day when I was doing it. <laughs> but before I before I start, I, I have both different songs on my phone. I, uh, the songs we say to church. Mm -hmm. And that gets me I listen to that for about half an hour. That gets me going and thinking and praying mm -hmm. and helping. Yeah. That's music. Good. good. Music. Very good. I think, I think too, we give God glory when we allow ourselves to be available and be a witness to Him to others. Mm -hmm. And then uh, let the light of God and His love shine out to others. Right. Mm -hmm. That's another way. Yeah. We witness for Him. And when we tell others yes. about Him, that's ascribing honor to him, mm -hmm. too, right? Because mm -hmm. we're esteeming him. Mm -hmm. we're, yeah. all we're all created unique as well. Mm -hmm. So um, he reaches into our hearts individually in a unique way. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next one here. She talked about um, God's, God's glory appearing to Moses in the desert. So, how have you seen God's glory during during your wilderness seasons? We've all gone through wilderness seasons, right? Mm -hmm. How have you seen God show up? I'm seeing Him working it out as you go through it. Yeah, I've seen Him working. Yep, yeah. yeah. God, God does that. Anything else? God. A lot of times I feel like he's holding me up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Like like I have more strength, just yeah. Kind of like that, that poem footprints in the sand. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well one time I was well at the home church I go to. We were just praise and thank the Lord, and all of a sudden this vision of these golden stars, and like the whole wall was lit up with, with the gold stars all over it. And we and, and somebody said, "You see that?" Said, "Yeah." And all of a sudden it faded, and it was God's story. Mm -hmm. That was God's story. It reminded you of that for sure, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. So okay, in Isaiah forty-two eight, uh, this was not in your lesson. But it came to my mind. In Isaiah 42, 8, it says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I will not, I will, see. I give my, I give to no other, so my glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. What do people give glory um, to rather than God? Themselves. 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 Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Money, money, possessions, possessions, celebrities, celebrities, pride, pride, power, power. Lots of things that people ascribe um, that to. Um, how does God respond in Romans? You have this on page twenty-nine in your book. Um, Romans 1, 22 to 25. How does God respond when people give glory to something else other than him? Mm. I don't know if you know what you're talking so. <laughs> Someone. Did you hear that? Okay. Didn't he abandon them? He abandoned them. He, yeah. he gave them up, right? If you're going to do that, go for it. I'm going to let you go that way and just keep going downhill. Right? Gives people 
forward to the consequences of their choices. Right? Yeah, because our choices do have consequences. And if they're going to do that, he's going to let them go. He works with them for a while, trying to keep them from there. But when they finally say, no way, he says, okay, you just go for it. Right. But it's, they, they deliberately blinded themselves. Right. Right. They did. They made the choice. They made the choice. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they knew the other way, they absolutely made the choice to go the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Still, same way with us today. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, they do a lot of choosing to believe their own carnal ways yeah. than than the ways of God. They they choose. Right. They don't they don't want to believe because then they would they would have to give up all their carnal. Men. Right. Okay. Uh, can you think of a time? When you accepted the glory that was due God, and what were the results? What was the question? Can you think of a time when you accepted glory that was due God, and what were the results? Anything I accomplish, I, I think, wow, I, I did a good job. But it was God giving me the ability to do it. Right. We need to remember that it wasn't all us. Right? right? It was him helping us with all of those things. And, um, and not take credit for something that was something that he helped us do. Yeah. And then she talked also about God's glory demands a response. And... Um, that was on page 31. What are the three responses that Moses had to God's glory? Well, pause, listen, and heed. Okay. What's written here? You got pause written. Okay. He was amazed. He was amazed. Uh huh. What else? He went to the bush. He went to the bush. Uh huh. And the third thing? He worshipped. He worshipped. How do we know he worshipped? He did not take off your sandals. He took off his sandals and he bowed his head, you know, or bowed low. Um, yes. Those are three responses that he had. Um, the one she has here in the book, it says uh, he looked to God. He, um, he humbled himself, recognizing his utter defilement and unworthiness. And then the third was he hid his face. Mm -hmm. I showed him reverence for God. Let's move on to day two. This one talks about God's priorities. Um, worship is so important to God that he gave specific instructions to Moses on how they were to worship him, Right? It was exact. We, you studied some of that, uh, the exact things he said to do. Um, and it shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, we are to approach God with reverence and awe mm -hmm. and come to him as he desires and not as we choose. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we rush into his presence and don't even think about it. And we need to re remember that he is an awesome God and that we need to come reverently to worship him um, because he's worthy of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes if we just run flippantly, it's like saying, oh, it's no big deal. God's not a, that big of a deal. I can just come however I want. I think he's a big deal. He I is so, a big deal. So right. excited to know him and worship him. I'm sorry, I would run and jump into his arms and right. hug him tight because right. mm -hmm. I love him. Yeah. He is a big deal. We need to give him the respect and honor that's due him. Okay, in Exodus 25 2, um, I forgot, oh, that's on page 33. What were the two requirements? For those who were to construct the tabernacle, they had to be his people. His people. And their hearts had to be stirred. And their hearts had to be stirred. How does that apply to us today? 
and that independent of our church together, the church body, that we must be the true people of God, the true servants of God, mm-hmm. and true ambassadors, mm-hmm. and that our hearts must always be stirred for Him and what the Holy Spirit will have us do. Mm-hmm. So, we have to first of all be, be saved. That's the first requirement, right? Mm-hmm. And the second one, those whose hearts are stirred. So it depends on what's happening around. This was for worship and for building the temple. Um, But in our situation, there's different tasks around. And when there's a need, God will stir hearts to meet that need. Okay? It doesn't mean everyone has to step up and do whatever the task is. God's going to stir the hearts. But then those are the ones, if God's stirring your heart, you need to listen and say, okay, God's prompting me. That must mean I, I should step up and do this, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. But he stirs the hearts, gets you like, you know, I should do that or something. Okay? Um, he did that when they were um, getting ready to um, build the temple, the tabernacle with all the gold. He stirred their hearts to give up, willingly give up the gold jewelry that they had gotten when they left Egypt. <coughs> And they willingly gave it. He didn't demand, you give this much, you give this much, you give this much. It was, he asked them to do it willingly. And it's the same with us. It's willingly, right? Okay. Um, Going on. God gave specific instructions to Moses for the tabernacle. What does that tell us about the importance of preparing to worship worship God? Well, he gave them specific instructions because it represented what would uh, be in, in reality mm-hmm. of, of what it mm-hmm. is. He was they were painting an image of the uh, bread of life, mm-hmm. and everything pointed to Jesus. Mm-hmm. So it had to be completely mm-hmm. it, exactly how they mm-hmm. said so. Mm-hmm. That's part of it. That's part of it. That's not the only reason, okay? But that is a very big part. And that's one reason Moses didn't get to go into the promised land, right? Because he misrepresented misrepresented Jesus in what he did. Okay? So um, he, he gave that. So what does that tell us for us? Is it important to prepare to worship? Yes. Okay, it, I think it is. So how do we prepare? What are some things that we can do to prepare for worship? Sean? I like to take a little bit of time and imagine that rather than running in, that there's a throne room and everybody gets seen, but that you have to come in. It's like Esther approaching the king. Mm-hmm. There, there was a, a way you go in and a way you don't go in. <laughs> and so, then, there, then the veil was torn when uh-huh. Jesus came uh-huh. and all were, uh-huh. uh, all who believed uh-huh. and loved him were welcomed in. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We're welcomed in, but is it important to prepare? Yes. Mm-hmm. What else can we prepare? We need to prepare our hearts. Prepare our hearts. We have the right attitude. Right attitudes. Are we going to get a lot out of the worship if we have an argument with someone earlier in the morning and or on the way to church? Are we going to be in an attitude of worship when we get here? No. So that's something that we can work on, right? We well, need to ask forgiveness and clear it up before that. Right. Oh, that is that is very important. Um, so. That leads me to the next question. So on page 35, um, on that take action part down there, according to 1 Samuel 5, 20, uh, 15, 25, and Psalm 51, 2, what must take place before worship? Cleansing the heart. Cleansing our heart, repentance. Mm-hmm. All of that has to take place before there's another verse that was not pointed out. Uh, would someone like to look up Matthew 5, 24? Who would look that up for me? Someone? 
We bear thy gift before the altar. Right. And go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. Right. Mm-hmm. So we don't like to think about that. But God is saying, you know, our getting our hearts cleansed is more important to him than being in the place of worship and offering gifts to him. Because if our heart's not right, our hearts need to be right first. Right? Well, when you're singing and worshiping, you're, um, you, you be, uh, there's a joy that wells up in you, and you're just worshiping with him in song and praise. But you can do that even when your heart is not right. You can go through the motions. But God's basically saying here, the outward appearance is not what's important to him, is it? It's the heart. It's the heart. Well, when you're praising and worshiping, but not showing off to others, no, that, there's, that a, is there's different. something yes. in you that... Right. But it all starts with the heart, right? You can do it either way. You can do it. You can stand up there and go through motions. You can stand in the pews and go through the motions. You can sing the songs. You can do all of that without a cleansed heart. Or you can do the same thing, but have the heart all cleansed and prepared to worship. And it's going to have a whole different change. A whole different thing's going to happen because you're actually really going to worship and not just go through the motions. What got, what got to me is uh, repeating what David repeated when he said, Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Uh, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy joy and Holy Spirit away from me. And when we do that and repent of anything that, that's in our hearts, then that's when the cleansing comes and we're ready. And I try to do that um, every day and, and, it's, and I also do it before communion. Mm-hmm. That's an important time to do it, too. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because uh, the joy of the Lord is what strengthens you. Right. It's what makes you strong <laughs> in, in Him. Right. And when you find joy in Him, and uh, it's, it, it's not all about, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's not all about being showy and and uh, coming in and just doing what everybody else is doing. You're you're a human being who's still who you are. Um, you're not. A, a lot of times you go into churches and everybody has the same hairstyle. Everybody has the same dress. And and uh, if they if everyone is fallen in line with no makeup, everybody has no makeup. You know, it's all surface, but. But there's there's a deeper there's a deeper thing. It's not going to church and right. and following what everybody because that's just a carnal way to mm-hmm. act. Mm-hmm. You are created in His image and in His likeness, but you were created unique. You are yes. uniquely you. Right. And but if you have to be because you have to still be around other people in the churches, you still have to. Um, I, I used to wear makeup all the time. I stopped wearing makeup because people act funny with makeup and they act funny with hairstyles and all these weird things that, that I do, not because I know, uh, not because that's what you're supposed to do. It's so that people will be more comfortable with you and it's just a carnal way of being. And, but the real the real worship comes from within yes. and it's in you, not what you're dressed in or what you're right. wearing or right. even the perfume. I stopped wearing perfume because it bothered people. Well, some people are allergic. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so um, even I, I think back of King Saul. What did King Saul do that God said, I have no pleasure in that? What was it that he he was trying to offer to God? And what did he do? He, he God had given him instructions. What did he do? He had told him to, to destroy everything. 
Oh, yeah. And he saved some of the... He saved uh, the best of stuff. Mm -hmm. And why did he say he saved the best of it? For, for, uh, for uh, offering to God. To offer it to God. <clears throat> and what was God's response or through Samuel? Well, what is better than sacrifice? To obey. To obey. To obey is better than sacrifice. And, and it's the same thing. If God is so concerned about the heart. And that's the, the thing that we really, if we're really going to uh, worship God, we need to focus on. Yes. In, in that passage, though, reading about Saul, when I read that, I get this impression like, oh, I got caught. So it, because he wasn't really planning. It, this is my what I read into it. It was like he got caught. Oh, no, I plan to give this to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's possible too, but it's still the wrong attitude, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Aaron telling you, oh, I, uh, the, this um, gold calf jumped out. Yeah, the gold calf. You gave, they gave me the gold and this calf just jumped out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's go on to day three talking about God's attributes. Um, last summer, uh, not this last summer, the summer before last, we studied some of the attributes of God. And I just love studying those things. Um, it, it's His names are his attributes, right? Every one of them we can, are, are him. It's who he is. Who he, who he is. So meditating on his attributes helps us to move from knowing about God to knowing God. Mm -hmm. I like that, that she said that. So, um, what you believe about God impacts how you respond to him. Is there an attribute of God that has impacted your life? She's got a whole list of, not a complete list, but she's got a list there on page 36. Mm -hmm. 36. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use one of those, but is there an attribute that... Um, of God that has just impacted your life, Rita. All knowing, all knowing. No, no matter, no matter what I did, He knows about it. No matter how troubled I am or bothered by Sheila, no, with you, I we don't have a Sheila. Anyhow, <laughs> you know. So um, He knows. He knows, and He knows how I really wanted to shoot my husband, so He helped me hide the gun from myself. You know, I mean that's. What <laughs> That's a good one. No, really, because uh, yeah, we when our when our family was healthy, really, you know, you know, you know the history. Um, he, we we prepared the, the night before before church. I mean, we did we did our family read, and everybody went to bed, and we got up, and it was sort of you know like peaceful music playing, and there was no arguing on the way to church, and. The, and because it was like a 20, about a 30 mile drive to church. And we did that every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And, you know, things changed. There was something, there was a dynamic, but there was an outside force that changed everything. So then you have to stop and recognize your joy robbers because they do exist. Yeah. Yeah. Mary Clark. Merciful. Merciful. He is. He, he gives us what we don't deserve, doesn't he? Absolutely. It's like Jonah. Mm -hmm. He put a covering, even though he, Jonah was pouting over the fact that he knew that it, it even says in Scripture that the Lord is loving and kind and uh, will forgive quickly, you know. Kind and Jonah loving. knew that, didn't he? And he knew that, and he hated these people because they did horrible things to mm -hmm. him and his family. Mm -hmm. And and he was pouting even, but the Lord put a covering over him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He did. He's a provider. He's a provider. Mm -hmm. and again and again, I can't list all that, but he has. Well, Jonah was up on the hill because he wanted to watch the destruction of the city. But he knew how forgiving the Lord was. And he, even though he was out in the middle of nowhere, and, and doing something that he shouldn't have been doing to begin with, in, or, or running from, the Lord still put a protection over him uh, from the sun. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the Lord. 
He, he protects us. He watches over us. You know, just like, like he said over Israel, if you would have known um, my, the, 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 my visitation, I would have gathered you like a hen mm-hmm. gathers her own chicks. And that's really, that's really his heart. Mm-hmm. And, and if we run around doing all these surface things, thinking this is what will make him love me and this is what will make him love me. No, he loves you to begin with and he'll put a protection around you and lead you and guide you to gentle water. Like it says, mm-hmm. he, he leadeth me by still waters. He, He's gentle and kind, and his and his thoughts are only good towards us. Is what Scripture says. And there's so many people that don't realize that that there's a there's a goodness about him that's that that far outweighs any kind of surface thing that we can do for each other. You know, it's just it's deeper than that. Yes. Yes. I'm so and I say healing, but too full purpose. Um, when I was 22, I got saved. And but when I got saved before that, even through my childhood, I had feeling feelings that were supposed to be lifelong. And six months after I got saved, God totally took me away from me. You know, we totally, completely. Doctors were amazed. They say that's has to be God. Because there's no way this, this could have happened otherwise. Uh, but more than that, is our spiritual healing. Mm-hmm. And then he's healed me in other ways too, you know. Um, e- even even um, emotionally, uh, financially, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. In so many ways he heals us. Mm-hmm. And if we just allow him to and trust him. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think that he's everywhere. Everywhere. I have to, yeah. Mm-hmm. I have to keep reminding myself. Mm-hmm. He's everywhere. Mm-hmm. Where can I hide from your presence? I can't. Yeah. Uh-uh. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's see where I was I here. Okay. Is there a time when you needed to understand God's power? She talked about his attribute of power. Were you facing something and you needed to know that God had all the power? Anyone want to share? Mm-hmm. Okay. Every surgery I had. Okay. Every surgery that I had. Uh-huh. During surgeries. I knew God was going to be there. Mm-hmm. I knew it was in my place. When Sarah had the first, second, and third degree burns. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just stood on what I knew. Mm-hmm. In my surgery, mm-hmm. I went under uh, for breast cancer. I didn't have any problem. I shared it with my engineers. I shared it with everybody how it was going to be because it's completely a different one than anybody's ever tried. And so I went and they came out and said, Jan, we got a slight problem and we don't know exactly what it is. But one side is dying, the other isn't. And they took, it's called a a tri-flap where they take a flap of your stomach and they crisscross it and they make your breast your body. And one side was dying. So we'll have to go back under. We went back under and they always ask, what kind of music do you like? I said, oh, Kenny G or, you know, all this. And I said, hey, don't worry. I know this is downstairs, but don't worry. I'm okay with it, you know? And I really was. I had peace like there was no other. They took me down four times. They brought me back up, and it was like Ben Casey, if anybody's old enough. But mm-hmm. Ben Casey and all the white jackets are around me saying, we're unplugging you up everything. Now, once you do that with breast cancer, and it was major, um, they take your morphine, they take everything. So it's like an elephant standing on your chest. So anyway, I just gave my faith. Mm-hmm. And I says, I'm, this is my happiest day here. You just don't understand. <laughs> and they must have thought I was really onto the drugs. But the thing was, all those people were touched. Mm-hmm. And I was just trying to share something ahead of time. And sure enough, they stopped everything. All the, I, I had nine pints of blood. He stopped everything. And when I came out, 
they went and said, we have no reason why this happened. There is a reason. And maybe it was that lady that fell out of her car and cracked her head. I heard it and I ran over. Yeah. God has a reason. You know, he saved her life. Yeah. We don't, we don't yeah. always get to know God why. is there. God he is there. there. He is always yeah. there. Yeah. Okay, where, where am I at on here? What about God's mercy? Yeah. It's new every morning. It's new every morning. Yeah. Um, he gives us so many blessings that we don't deserve. So many things. Okay. On page 38, she talks about the justice of God. And she doesn't have any place for you to write anything down. But I'm reminded of God's justice. It has two sides to it. The two sides that I see is one, he punishes me for my sin. Not because, you know, it's, it's so that I can get back in relationship with him, right? Mm -hmm. he, he allows me to go through those consequences so that I will make it right and come back. But the other side of that is that he also punishes those who sin against me. Um, like, like a murderer, if he murdered a family member, or something. He's going to punish that person. And I don't need to worry about it. But in, in a way, that is a relief to me, knowing that he's going to do the revenge, and I don't have to worry about it. But he's going to take care of that. Mm -hmm. It was a wrong. It was really wrong for something like that. And yet, I know he's going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the two sides. Yes, he's going to punish me when I don't do right. But he's also going to take care of the issues with those who mm -hmm. sin against me. Mm -hmm. But then there's also this other quote here that she has here. God never gives laws without buffering it with grace. God is, always has a balance in everything he does. He's not one-sided and you know, against the other. He's like in the middle, and, and we, we look at it as this way or this way, and God's more like in the center of both things, <laughs> and balance. And so he gives laws, and are, his law, are the laws God gives just so he can have domineering over us? No. They're for our good, right? But then he also knows that we're not going to be able to obey them all, right? So then he also gives us the and, and forgiveness and all of those things when we fail, doesn't he? Yes. One touch, and this has happened a number of times, but God God showed it to me in such a way. I was like, wow, I could suddenly see um, reality and see truth. And so one of God's attributes is, you know, he is right, he is correct, he is, you know, not only is he all-knowing, but then he's merciful and he is just, um, and he's patient with us. He showed me what I was doing wrong, and that was so incredibly, you know, on my, uh, putting me on my face before God and apologizing for I need to. Yet, it's all only because God is God. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the correction. I mean, we if we were not his children, he wouldn't correct us. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. He also does other things that are... He, use, he even uses humor to get his point across. Yes. And you realize yeah. that that's what he did. And mm -hmm. you were in the wrong when you did what you did do. I mean, he uses all different circumstances to get his point across and he'll try to use the gentler way but he'll put more and more pressure on it. right it kind of brings to mind in the chosen how many have seen the chosen okay where peter and matthew have this rift it goes on from the very beginning you know and finally god points out to each one their faults 
they each got faults. Mm -hmm. and, and each of them was only seeing the other's faults. Mm -hmm. They weren't seeing their own faults. Mm -hmm. And he points that out to them and it enabled them to be able to forgive and come together. Mm -hmm. And that's, God is so good at that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He points out to us what we need to, to know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end this day with that last uh, paragraph that she has there on page 38. Yes, 38. Understand that sin leads to consequence. God punished the children of Israel even to the third and fourth generations. But his grace and mercy provided forgiveness. Although he punished sin, he loved the sinners. And that's what we need to remember. He punished the sin, but he loves the sinners. And that's why he punishes it, right? Yeah, love, like I've always said, and I have heard throughout the years, love the sinner, but hate the sin. Right. right. Well, let's move on to day four, his acceptance. Um, to worship God appropriately, we also need to grasp his acceptance. So what is the problem that keeps us from being accepted by God? Talk about the problem. Ourselves. Ourselves? More specifically? All our focus is on us and not on him. Right. And, and, and our sin, too, right? Mm -hmm. All of that. Us. Our, and that's part of it. When we're focused on us, that's pride, right? Yes. And that's a sin. So all of that's all together. And she talks in there. Well, you're focusing on the things of the world, too. Right. What's mm -hmm. going on in your life. Right. How you need to get this, this, and this done, but you're not really focusing what what God wants you to be doing in that moment. Right. Mm -hmm. She talked on this day about, um, about the celebration of the Day of Atonement. We just learned a little bit about that. The Day of Atonement was this month. They just finished going through that just a couple of weeks ago, or was it a week ago, or just shortly. <laughs> it wasn't very long ago. So there are some things that God was pointing out to me that I want to... I want to go through with you. So would you um, turn to Leviticus 16 with me? Here, starting with verse 3 through 22. I'm going to read it and then we're going to discuss some things about it. Can you give the verse again? 16, 3 through 22. Okay. Okay? Well, look. 16. Leviticus 16, starting with verse 3. <coughs> but in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram. For a burnt offering, he shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen garment on his body, and he shall tie the linen uh, sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall pass lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azul, Azazel, or whatever. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented live before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness of Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself, and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. 
He shall kill the bull as a, as a sin offering for himself. He shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handfuls of sweet incense, beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil, and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony, so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on each side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Then he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement to, in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by a hand of a man who is in readiness. And the goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself at, uh, to a remote area and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness." Now, for Baptists was the escape goat. Right. So, when you hear about the Day of Atonement, most all of the focus is on going in with the blood. Right? And that's a very important thing. But there's this other thing with this scapegoat that is important for us to understand. Because who does it represent? The Baptists. No, represents Jesus. Well, the escape goal. No, represents Jesus. All the sins were, all of our sins were placed on Jesus. Jesus. Yes, but th then, right? then there was two separate people. They, they, they want they they uh, sacrificed Jesus. They mm -hmm. said, uh, you know, crucify him, but let Barabbas go. And Barabbas was let go. He, he, he was let go, but he never had our sins on him. No, no, I know. So had all the sins of the people placed on him, just like Jesus had all of our sins placed on him. The difference was in Jesus, both goats were in one person, whereas in the Old Testament, it was two different things. One shed the blood and one had the had the sins placed on but Jesus did both, didn't he? He took our sins in his own body to the cross, and he died for them. He took <coughs> both positions. But that is, I think that is an important thing to remember, that he took my sin. Mm -hmm. In the Old Testament, did it take away sin? It covered it. They had to do it again the next year, and then the next year, and then the next year. But Jesus did it once for all. Didn't he? And I, I just, you know, I, I think that's so important to understand. I am accepted. Why? Is it because I've done good things? No. No. The only way I can be accepted is because he died and bled for me. He took my sin upon himself and he died there at the cross. Once for all, it's washed away. That's why I'm accepted. That's why the Father can look on me because he sees me 
to the veil of his son. Therefore, I have done bad things, but God can look on me. He can accept me. Right? I, I just think that's so important for us to understand. It's not anything I've done. It's it's because of what he's done that I can be accepted. Right. And I, I just wanted to point that out because it, it just, I think that was important for me to see that my sin was placed on him. And that scapegoat gets looked over on a lot of times when people talk about the atonement. They talk about the sprinkling of the blood. And yes, that was very necessary. And not only did they do it on the mercy seat, they also had to do it on the altar and, and stuff too, right? But um, and So on the day of atonement, all of this stuff happened. He had to get himself prepared, wash, put on all these clean clothes, the right ones he was supposed to do. He had to take the bowl, sacrifice, get the blood, take it in, sprinkle it. And that the, the blood of the bowl was for who? It was for himself and for his family, okay? So that he could be right before God. Then he went out and got the blood of the goat and did the same thing, and that was for the sins of the people, okay? And then he went, and, and they had to be uh, um, sacrificed and, and, and on the altar too. And then he um, took that live goat, Put the hands. So Jesus didn't in. die in uh, uh, for uh, in place of Barabbas. Then no. Jesus. He, oh, he, he did. Well, he did. He did. But he also died in place of us. Yeah, I mm -hmm. I know, but it's still uh, it. Uh, the scripture shows different layers again, mm -hmm. and uh, Barabbas uh, was set free mm -hmm. because Jesus died on mm -hmm. the cross instead of him. Yeah. So it means two different things. What he did, uh, he, he did pay the price that Barabbas was supposed to, uh, supposed to pay. And he paid the price that I was supposed to pay. Yeah. And he paid, paid all of that, yes. But the other thing about this, about two goats is that it also represent, could represent the dual nature of Christ being mm -hmm. man and God. It, there's so many things, the, the, the blood that cleanses us, but the goat that takes our sins away. So Jesus was so much better than a goat. <laughs> you know, you know it, it just carried him away, you know, temporarily. But Jesus removed them. Removed them. Let, let's move on. We're running out of time, but I just wanted to go through that because I just thought it was so important. So, according to Hebrews on page 41, Hebrews 4.16, um, what is the only solution to our sin problem? And why can we approach God strong with confidence? The first uh, it's in the first paragraph of the Take Action on page 41. What's the solution to our sin problem and why can we approach God's throne with confidence? Because God accepts us in Christ. He does. Mm -hmm. He accepts us in Christ. And because of that, I can boldly approach the throne of grace, right? Mm -hmm. So it says in Hebrews, I can come boldly to him and ask my requests. Yes, mm -hmm. I can have that confidence. Okay, let's move on to day five. His approval. Um, so what needs to be our motive if we are to get God's approval? Right. Our focus needs to be on him all the time, all the time, all the time. Um, in Exodus 3, 10 through 16, she, she goes through this story about Moses with all of this stuff. What was Moses' concern there in the first few verses? He had to lead the people. How can I lead this people? 
So he was concerned about that. He was also concerned about, oh, I'm not a man of great words. I can't speak well. All of this stuff. So his focus was on who? Himself. On himself. And God had to get his focus off of him because he points out, had I not made your mouth? And then God also gives him some signs, right? That God is going to be with him. It's important that we know that, that God's going to be with us. It was important that God know, uh, Moses know that when he went back to Pharaoh, God was going to be with him, right? Right. He wasn't going alone. He was going with God. Right. Okay. Um, so God redirected his focus. And what was God's problem with the Pharisees in Matthew 23, uh, on the next page there, uh, 23, 23 to 29? Mm -hmm. Just, it, it asks you to paraphrase it. What was the problem with the Pharisees? They were hypocrites. Why? They said one thing and did another. Right. Their, their big thing was on appearance, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was on appearance. And also, they, they exacted all the little things, but didn't really have the heart. It was all outward stuff that they were focused on. There was no purity. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and that's the big thing that God wants us to get to. It's all about the heart. So I'm just going to read, in closing, the last paragraph that she has on page 44, The Heart of the Matter. Deuteronomy 4.29 says that when we search for the Lord with all our hearts, we will find him. So what keeps us from seeking his face and clearly hearing his voice? Maybe our hearts are at the core of the problem. God seeks passionate followers who love him passionately. He doesn't care about our religious activity, only that our actions are, are rooted in the love for him. Mm -hmm. To be single-minded minded in our search for God, our hearts cannot be caught up in details that steal attention from him. Maybe we don't find him and hear his voice clearly because our attention is divided. Instead of being consumed with gaining his approval, we are distracted by the lure of other acceptance. <coughs> so that ends that. And I'm going to go ahead and start the video. I have put, oh, I'm going to stop this first.